Welcome everybody to, I think this is the fifth uh, Zoom conference uh, study for the Holy Order. And uh, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, we start these right on time, right at seven. So we've got 31 participants right now. We'll see if more come in. I've heard from a lot of people that they like these recordings and then they listen to them whenever they can get around to it. And I really, really appreciate Cameron. He's been so easy to work with and so great uh, getting these recordings up. And I'd also like to thank Peter Brown, who uh, is helping us with all the technical support for the conference website, including uh, putting these recordings on that website. Thank you, Peter, really appreciate it. So um, we're gonna to begin tonight with an opening prayer. I've asked my brother Gordon if he would give that. Uh, Gordon? Or is the volume okay? Can you hear me? It's good. Okay. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful to meet tonight to discuss the words that you have given us through Denver regarding the Holy Order. We acknowledge our unworthiness and our incapacity. We don't, we don't always understand everything that we should, and we ask thee to help us as we uh, as McKay leads the discussion tonight to uh, allow the Spirit to teach us and to guide McKay so that he can uh, present his thoughts in, in a way that will uh, inspire us and, and perhaps give us some new things to think about. We're so grateful for your willingness to teach us, help us to be worthy of that gift. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gord. Appreciate that. So uh, next week, uh, Vaughn Hughes will be leading a discussion on the uh, Melchizedek Priesthood and beginning a discussion on the the priesthood as a channel and i'm going to tee up one question for him tonight um i hope you'll join us next week as well this week we're going to have a discussion on altered history and i'm going to share my screen here There we go. So the uh, kind of the title of the discussion tonight comes from this first line in the Holy Order paper. The history of the priesthood in this dispensation is made more difficult to understand because some events are not recorded and what is recorded has been altered. And uh, that's from page 133 of the Teachings of Denver Snuffer, Part 4, Volume 4. Hmm, that's interesting. That didn't, I thought I would, oh, there it is. So this um, talk is about altered history, but also obscured truth and confounded language and revised revelations, and it spills over into uh, Von Hughes' section uh, where he will talk about changed ordinances. Um, I have four questions to ask uh, the participants tonight, and if you have a good answer to any of these questions, I'd like you to write them in the chat. Give, give us your answer. 
I'll have Cameron look at those uh, over the course of the next half hour, and uh, we'll see if uh, anyone can answer these questions in a way that makes sense. And he'll uh, he'll read a few of these. The first question is this one: Why is altered history part of a talk on the holy order? We want to understand something more than we have been given. And so Denver in this talk teaches a lot about the holy order. And these are things that he's going to add to our understanding. So why talk about how history got butchered or how truth was obscured? Anyway, that's my question. Second question I'm going to ask early on is, something we've talked about with several of the earlier uh, discussions. What is priesthood? Can you define it succinctly or define its synonym, the holy order? And we'll see if somebody can come up with a, a, a clear definition. So the first thing Denver goes over is how uh, Oliver Cowdery changed patriarchal blessings these blessings were given by Joseph Smith in 1833. Two years later, Oliver made some changes. In the case of Joseph Smith's father and mother, those blessings were changed to the tune of adding about uh, four parts to one. Uh, Eighty percent of the text is new uh, compared to what was there in the original 1833 recording of that blessing. In the case of Joseph's brother, Don Carlos, it was even more pronounced, uh, over 90, about 90% of the blessing is new. And in Oliver Cowdery's own blessing, more than 90% uh, was added to the original blessing. So I thought it would be interesting to look at uh, Oliver Cowdery's blessing and see just what he added well, here's the original blessing. Let's read it. Blessed of the Lord is brother Oliver, for he shall be made like unto a bow, which the Lord hath set in the heavens. He sh shall be a sign unto the nations. These are Joseph's prophetic uh, blessing to Oliver. Behold, he is blessed of the Lord for his constancy and steadfastness in the work of the Lord. Wherefore, he shall be blessed in his generations and they shall never be cut off, and he shall be helped out of all his troubles, because he shall keep the commandments of the Lord and hearken unto his counsels. Now, you might see this as a prophecy. I don't. I see this as this uh, highlighted yellow part as a, a caveat or a, a subjunctive statement. If he keeps the commandments, these other things will follow. So that's the whole blessing. Here's what Oliver added. Now, you're not expected to uh, read this, but I, I put it up there to show you just how much the original blessing showed and this final blessing. This is the addition. So let's drill down a little bit more on this. Okay, Here's there's, some a, of the things. there's a question. Sorry to interrupt you. There's a question. That's okay. I was saying, is that 80 or 90% of the number of words? Is that how you calculated that percentage? Uh, yes. Okay. There is no end to the blessings and glories that shall come upon my brother Oliver yet in his days. Sounds like hyperbole to me. He shall be a choice lawyer in Israel. That sounds like wishful thinking. He shall also stand in the councils of nations and states and his voice shall be heard in the midst of the most renowned among the statesmen of the world, and by his superior intelligence and great wisdom convince them of their errors. Thus shall he be reverenced. Now you got to ask yourself, does this sound like the word of the Lord? Is this the way the Lord talks to people? Anyway, Sounds like a proudful man who didn't let didn't check his pride at the door to me. 
And he added all this. So the second example Denver gives is the how the history of the church was altered. And what he means, we're talking about a, a book, a work called The History of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how that document was altered. That document was originally called The History of Joseph Smith, the Prophet, and later The History of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and finally The Documentary History of the Church. And he uses these two quotes. The introductory assurance that, quote, no historical or doctrinal statement has been altered is demonstrably wrong, according to LDS historian Richard Wagner. And this statement by one of Joseph Smith's clerks, I noticed the interpolations, which means insertions, because having been employed in the historian's office at Nauvoo, by Dr. Willard Richards and employed too in 1845 in compiling this very autobiography, I know that after Joseph's death, his memoir was doctored to suit the new order of things, and this too by the direct order of Brigham Young to Dr. Richards and systematically by Richards. There's a lot in that statement. We're going to try and unpack it a little bit. So how big of a problem really is this? Well, on the day Joseph was killed, there were 812 pages of the history that had been written. And that includes uh, up to the August 5th entry of 1838. So that means 100% of the Nauvoo history was written after Joseph died. According to Brigham Young, at the time of Joseph's death, he had reviewed 5% of the history, that's about 40 pages. Soon after Joseph died, Brigham Young reviewed all the history, gathered all the documents, and in the midst of this crisis where the enemies were coming after him, they had the temple to build and all these things had to be done, Brigham focused on reviewing the history and began revising, in his own words, the history. 98% of the Joseph Smith history was never seen or reviewed by Joseph Smith, including 100% of the history of the Nauvoo period. That is quite a number. Yet this is what the work was called, the history of Joseph Smith the prophet by himself. That is just wrong. This isn't by himself, 98% of it he didn't even see. Well, these are the two historians that uh, produced the lion's share of that document. Wildred Richards was scribed to Joseph Smith while he was alive. He uh, spent almost the whole time from the time of Joseph's death until they left Nauvoo a couple of years later working on the history. Then they packed it up in boxes, shipped it out to Salt Lake in wagons. And a couple of years later, they unboxed it. Willard Richards began again to write the history, wrote a single sentence, and then died. I would love to know what that sentence was. Then it was turned over to George A. Smith, and he completed the history, and finally it was published. So this is a fascinating uh, insight written by George A. Smith. I want to read the whole thing, and I focused on, let's focus on these yellow parts. I had, this is a letter he wrote to assistant church historian Wilford Woodruff. I had to revise and compare two years of back history, which Richards had compiled, filling up numerous spaces which had been marked as omissions on memoranda by Dr. Richards. I commenced compiling the history of Joseph Smith from April 1st of 1840 to his death on June 27th of 1844. I have filled up all the reports and sermons of President Joseph Smith and others from minutes or sketches taken at the time in longhand by all these people and which was an immense labor requiring the deepest thought and the closest application, as there were mostly only two or three words 
about half written to a sentence. The greatest care had to be taken to convey the ideas in the prophet's style as near as possible, and in no case has the sentiment been varied that I know of. Listen to all those qualifiers. This is a man who produced the, the lion's share of the important history of the church, telling us exactly how it came about. So here's an example of this filling up spaces business. I think many of you have seen this. Evening at home and walked up and down the streets with my scribe, gave instruction to try, that's like trial, excommunication, disciplinary council, to try those persons who are preaching, teaching, or practicing the doctrine of plurality of wives, period. Okay, that's where the journal entry ended. From there until this line, Joseph forbids it and the practice thereof, there was an empty space that had to be filled up, filling up numerous spaces. This is what he's talking about. And in the margin, to be revised. Somebody wrote to be revised, so they revised it because they can't have this in the history because this doesn't, this makes it sound like polygamy is wrong. And that Joseph Smith fought it. And as we all knew, the new order of things is you have to be a polygamist to go to heaven. Otherwise, you'll be damned. So somebody adds, for according to the law, I have the pow the keys of this power in the last days, for there is never but one on the earth at a time in whom this power and the keys of the kingdom are conferred and as i have constantly said no man shall have but one wife at a time unless the lord directs otherwise that's all just added in there so that that's that was the work of george a smith that's what he was doing filling up these spaces and trying to make sense of two or three words about half written to a sentence and trying to do it in the prophet's style and trying to not mistakes that he knows of. That's that's what he was doing. Now, here's a few specific examples of how the history was uh, uh, altered. You see those words in yellow? Rough stone rolling down. That is what was written in the uh, history. The rest of that statement was just made up by George A. Smith to make sense of the words that were in the history, rough stone rolling. Here's another one. Um, on the left, the history recorded a sermon uh, that uh, Joseph gave. Wilford Woodruff took notes, and here's what Wilford said in his diary. He said, Joseph had reported, if we don't accuse one another, God will not accuse us, and if we had no accuser, we should enter heaven, and he, is that Joseph or God, he would take us there as his backload. And if we would not accuse him, Joseph, he would not accuse us. And if we would throw a cloak of charity over him, he would throw a cloak of charity over us. This is a, a quote you're familiar with. Well, Brigham Young wanted to be a leader. He wanted to have people follow him. And so he threw this in. He added this little line, and if you will follow the revelations and instructions which God gives you through me, then I will take you in as my backload. He has Joseph, he adds these words to what Joseph said, and then when he becomes prophet number two, then the people have to follow the instructions that God gives him through Brigham in order to get to heaven. Here's another one, blacks in the priesthood. Here's what was recorded in the history. He, Joseph, spoke of the curse of Ham for laughing at Noah while in his wine, but doing no harm. That's it. Um, Brigham Young adds, Noah was a righteous man and yet drank his wine and became intoxicated and the Lord didn't forsake him in consequence thereof. For he retained all power in his priesthood and when he was accused by Cain, he cursed him according to the priesthood which he held 
And the Lord had respect for his word. And the priest said, which he can't read that word. Notwithstanding he was drunk, the curse remains upon the posterity of Cain until the present day. Just made up. Just added out of nowhere in order to establish that Joseph Smith uh, was behind the curse of blacks and the priesthood. And yet he wasn't. There's no hint of that in the original quote. All right, well, what's going on? Why can't I move forward here? Oh, there we go. Oh, I see. It's it's uh, had a delay. Here's another one. Here's this prophecy. Everything you see in yellow first shows up in the history of the church. It has absolutely no origin that we can find. David Bitton, the assistant church historian, said there is no prophecy in the handwriting of Joseph Smith. No such prophecy published during his lifetime. But it was referred to in general terms in 1846 during the trek west. And then they finally put it into the history sometime in the 50s. And this is just a made up. Talk about fake news. Here we got a fake prophecy. So here's my kind of summary of the history of Joseph Smith, the book. It is ghost written entirely by polygamists. It is untrustworthy. It exhibits plagiarism, editorialization, misquotes, malattributions. That's when somebody says something and they attribute it to Joseph Smith. Altered voice, best guesses, and extrapolation. Okay, that's history altered. Um, now, here's a couple of statements Denver makes about truth that are worth reviewing. Many of those involved believe that if truth needed a little embellishment to make it more persuasive, it was appropriate and right to do so. And so I just showed you some examples of how this was done with polygamy, prophecy, Brigham Young's mantle, alcohol, uh, authority. I haven't shown some of those examples, but those are what the history changed in order to get the narrative that was more persuasive. Denver also says there is a faith crisis for many members of the church when they realize some historical facts are either demonstrably untrue or entirely made up. That, however, shouldn't deter those who are willing to labor at it. Stripped of falsehoods, what remains is glorious and inspiring, even if it undermines institutional claims. The truth should never have been altered to support anyone's agenda. We should only care to know and understand God's will and work. That statement about how we must labor to find the truth uh, reminded me of this statement in talk number one of the 10 talks. That man knew how obscure truth is, how deep it lies buried, how far from mortal sight it is plunged into the depths, how it will admit only a few, by how much work it is reached, how practically no one ever succeeds, how it is dug out with difficulty, and then only bit by bit. I have... I have so much gratitude in my heart that Denver dug so hard and did so much work to sort out the truth. Now, it's still not super easy for us to arrive at the truth, but so very much easier than if he hadn't done all this work. Now, all we need to do is study and ponder his, uh, what he's taught and and he has sorted out some of the most difficult things. When he wrote um, Preserving, no. The, well, one of his, his, the book that got him excommunicated, I can't think of the title of it right now. 
I realized no one had ever seen what he saw in DNC 124 about, about the statement of the Lord, build a temple and build it now, or you will be rejected as a church with your dead. I never heard in a lifetime in the Mormon church, I never heard anybody comment on that, that statement. And I read it number, a number of times and just went in one ear and out the other. But he did the hard work of thinking, pondering, digging it out. And we are the beneficiaries. So another point here is how language is confounded. Now, that, that's my term, not Denver's. But he points out how the, the word priesthood is um, intended to mean one thing and has been turned into something very different. Today, priesthood means the authority to perform certain perfunctory ordinances as long as you get the permission of somebody else. And that's all it means. Apostle means someone sent with a message from Jesus Christ, and today it is completely confounded to mean a member of a hierarchical quorum. Elder used to mean an older person and therefore uh, with some experience and wisdom. And now it is an office in the priesthood. And office has been confounded to imply that you can have an office in a priesthood, whereas it used to mean only an office in a church or an office in an organization. There's no such thing as a priesthood office. All of these words have been confounded to um, as part of the obscuring of truth. The next thing he goes over is how revelations are revised. And he talks, well, first of all, in May of 28, Joseph and Oliver are visited by an angel and they're given the priesthood of Aaron and Another priesthood is described, a higher priesthood that has the power to confer the Holy Ghost. Uh, the history that Joseph wrote in 1828 makes no mention of a visit from Peter, James, and John. And so those who didn't, I don't know exactly why this was done, but they altered an 1830 revelation to include a visit from Peter, James, and John in which they imply the priesthood was conferred. Uh, so here's that revelation. It's uh, DNC 27. And here's the key part of that revelation that we are going to look at. The hour cometh that I, the Lord, will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth and with those whom my Father hath given me out of the world. Now, there's no mention of who those people are in the original revelation. Just all those that the Father hath given me. And uh, for some reason, the committee putting together the Doctrine and Covenants, which included Oliver Cowdery and Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams, decided to add Moroni and Elias and a bunch of others. And uh, they add a substantial amount of information. Here's the, the, the Lord is going to have wine with all those whom the Lord hath given him. Uh, presumably this is part of some meal. And so a guest list is added that includes Moroni and John and Noah and Elijah and Joseph and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Michael and Peter, James and John. These are the people that they add. And with each of those people, they mention something, as, as in this case, Moroni, whom I've sent to reveal the Book of Mormon, containing the fullness of my everlasting gospel, to whom I've committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. Um, well, so why'd they do this? Well, I have a theory. It's just my theory. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's wrong. But just hear me out. <clears throat> as part of the 1830 five Doctrine and Covenants, uh, a, a preface was written, and this is part of the preface. You won't find that in your modern uh, LDS Doctrine and Covenants. There's no preface there. 
uh, but uh, we included it as TNC section 110. And I think it tells us why they added this guest list. The church, viewing this subject to be of importance, appointed their servants and delegates, the high council, your servants to select and compile this work. Several reasons might be adduced in favor of this move of the council. We only add a few words. They knew that the church was evil spoken of in many places. Its faith and beliefs misrepresented and the way of truth subverted. By some, it was represented as, I can't actually read it on my screen, not believing the Bible, I think it says. So, you know, you've all been there. You've been misrepresented. You've had ideas. You've had attitudes and somebody mischaracterizes them and it's hurtful and we don't like it. We don't like to have our our points of view misrepresented and they were the same way. And so I think they altered this document to include all these Bible people to show the world that they were a Bible believing people. So look at all those Bible people, but why Moroni? Why do they include one uh, Book of Mormon person when all the rest are Bible people? Well, here's your answer. Because Moroni, according to these brethren, was the one sent to, pro to proclaim the everlasting gospel and who was committed the keys to record the stick of Ephraim, which is a Bible prophecy. So Moroni literally was the only person in the Book of Mormon who the early members of the church felt fulfilled Bible prophecy. And that's why they included him. They were trying to convince the world they believed in the Bible. So here's the Here's the revelation that in the early days of the church was said to be fulfilled by Moroni. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth. Notice the same language in DNC 27 tied to Moroni, this everlasting gospel. So now here's my third question. I can't wait to hear what people say about this. Did Moroni have a part in the restoration? Denver has told us Moroni is not the one that showed up in Joseph's bedroom. Year after year, it was Nephi. Did Moroni have a part in the restoration? Now, this question I'm going to ask is the fourth and last question, but let's let Von Hughes answer this one next week did peter james and john have a part in the restoration denver says that in the history that joseph wrote there was no mention of peter james and john so did they have a part in the restoration uh von hughes will also go over this part of my list next week how ordinances were changed anyway those are my questions uh, i'm going to stop sharing now and i wonder uh cameron if you could uh put your handsome face back on here and maybe ask uh, read a few of the answers in the chat to the questions i ask yeah would you like to start at the uh first questions or this most recent yeah. I'm I'm done talking. I'm going to just sit here and sip my protein drink and let you. Oh, I've got bad news for you. That's not uh, not necessarily how this works. <laughs> uh, okay, question number one: Why is understanding altered history in a talk on the holy order? Uh, we had a handful of responses to this. Um, Altered history leads to disorder, so like Abraham, we must seek to recover the original. That was uh, one of the answers. Do you wish to comment, or do you want me to roll through all of these? What are your thoughts? Oh, read two or three of them. Okay. Uh, another one was, because we no longer have hardly any understanding of what priesthood was intended to be. 
thus holy order. Um, another one is a quoting of scripture, Second Timothy four. Uh, for in the for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And there's a follow up comment that I think I was understanding correctly uh, was pointing out that shall used here they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into unto fables is uh, typically used in the scriptures to indicate a commandment, not necessarily a future prediction. Very good. Um, Can we keep going? I'd like to add my uh, answer to that one. Yeah, go ahead. It is not enough for us to add light and knowledge to what we already know. We must tear down and eliminate and eradicate false ideas we cannot be fit for heaven if we carry with us all the false and vain and foolish doctrine that we were taught we have to jettison that and then gain more light and knowledge to be fit for heaven okay how about the second question uh yeah hang on let me just uh One more here I think is worth pointing out, which I think is uh, really along the lines of what you're saying here um, on this first question. And it is, it was necessary to establish that history had been altered so that Denver could define the Holy Order priesthood without building atop past errors. Um, if I'm following yeah. correctly, that's what nice. you're saying is we really got to yeah. throw it away and, and start over, right? Yeah. When you build a, a home, you want to go down to bedrock. Yeah. Not build on top of the ruins of prior civilizations. Right. Uh, we have a late entry for the answer to question one. Oh, let's hear what Joe has to say. <laughs> uh, he says that we should waste and wear out our lives in bringing to light all the hidden things of darkness wherein we know them, and they are truly manifest from heaven. Well, I think we should. Um, the question is, why should we, Joe? Yeah. Anyway, thank you. <clears throat> okay, question two. We're moving on. Uh, I switched screens, so if you keep typing answers, I'm not going to see them right now. Sorry. Uh, okay, what is the holy order? Um, we've got uh, we've got three entries here. The holy order is to make of flesh and blood the surrogates of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. Another says, the holy order is the channel through which all knowledge, doctrine, the plan of salvation, and every important matter is revealed from heaven. That sounds like it's pulled out of the glossary, if I'm uh, not mistaken there. Uh, number three is, the holy order consists of obtaining the powers of the holy priesthood. And they uh, linked TNC 151.9. I'd have to go refresh my memory on what that is. Uh, so those were three entries for for answer two. Do you want to comment on those, or do you want me to? to I to like all of those. I, I like Joseph's mine. answer the best. Um, the holy order. If I could, you know, my best stab at it, and I don't have it. I don't have it uh, boiled down perfectly for sure. But the holy order is an order of men and women, meaning a subgroup of men and women who are holy and adopted sons and daughters of God through whom God channels his work. Now, that's that, that would be my stab at it. Let me hit you with my stab at it. Good. Uh, it's a little shorter than yours, but it sounds like it's maybe kind of along the same lines. God working with mortals to move ahead their work. Very good. Yeah, that's more, you're more defining the function of the holy order rather than what the order itself is. If you don't define that it's this small membership group 
you've missed the point of the the order. It's a Benedictine order. It's the order of the arrow. It's the beneficent order of protective elks. What's that called? It's yeah. a it's a it's a group of men and women. Sure, but is the group that functions as you said? Is 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 the group a byproduct? As in having a group and a you know a group that's the order is that a byproduct of the work progressing? That's how I view it. I don't view it as the group has to come first in order to get the work done. I view it as the work has to get done, and in order to get it done, it's yeah a group is created to do the work. It's a it's a okay. I'll agree to disagree on that one. Okay, that's fine. I think step one is to adopt men and women into his family. And then he puts them to work. Anyway, let's keep going. This okay, is good. keep going. <laughs> okay, let's see. Question three. Did Moroni have a part in the restoration? Uh, I saw one answer coming to that. Uh, Joseph Smith said it was Nephi. That was later redacted by subsequent leaders. Um, you asked me this question beforehand, and uh, I'll, you know, no, no shame here. I'll say my answer was no. As I was thinking through it, I didn't come. No example came to mind uh, for me. But uh, let me just scan the chat here. Um. No, I don't see any other responses there. You wanna you wanna address that one about Moroni? Well, uh, yeah, I, and and I asked the question in my fellowship uh, Sunday, and at that point, I I I couldn't think of an example, so I went into the teachings and commandments and typed in the word Moroni and and read the verse in what is Doctrine and Covenant section one twenty eight where he talks about all the people that were participated in the restoration. Uh, Michael detecting the angel when he appeared, the devil when he appeared as an angel of light, and Raphael and Peter, James, and John, the voice of Peter, James, and John declaring their keys, and a voice from Camorra, Moroni, declaring whatever. So yes, he did have a part in the restoration. Joseph heard his voice, and he heard it at Camorra. I don't know when that was, but uh, Joseph was at Camorra at least twice. Was it when he first appeared and got shocked when he tried to grab the plates, or was it when the plates were finally handed over? I don't know. Uh, somebody commented, I think this was the same... Uh... Same that answered the question earlier. I think they believed Moroni had dispensation, and thus the same as Peter, James, and John. We hear Moroni's voice in the Book of Mormon. That's how we're hearing his voice from Camorra. Yeah, so he's just commenting along with you there. The, oh, uh, I see. Voice from Camorra. Oh, he thinks the voice is in the record of the plates. Interesting. Okay, yeah. that's an interesting take on it, Micah. Thank you. Joe says Morona kept and buried the plates and added the last, his own book, and abridged the translated text of the book of Ether. It seems like uh, when you asked the question, and I don't know if you clarified it uh, uh, well during the presentation, but specifically, the was Moroni involved in Joseph's time, not in the restoration as a whole or in God's work as a whole? Okay, well, it's an interesting question. I'm glad to have brought it up and have people thinking about it. And then that was that was the questions. Those were the questions. All right, well, thank you for joining with me in this study. It's only been 45 minutes, and we're going to wrap it up a little early. Uh, uh, next, I've had to coordinate a little bit with... Uh, von hughes on this so we figured out where to end my discussion and where to begin his because ours overlap a bit and uh, he will go over uh, the melchizedek priesthood in 
uh, Joseph's day. And um, why don't you ask the fourth question again, which is. And the fourth up. question is, did Peter, James and John have a role in the restoration? Denver says Joseph's history doesn't even mention them. Did they have a role in the restoration? You guys think about that, do some research, and Vaughn will answer for you next week, I think. All right, thank you. Uh, Krista Fawcett, would you be willing to uh, give us a closing prayer? Uh, Krista wants me to say it on her behalf, if that's okay. Thank you. Our Father in Heaven, we're so grateful this day that we have the opportunity to gather online among those of us within the, the covenant that we can discuss and we can seek after more truth regarding the Holy Order talk that's coming and that we can get more acquainted with the scriptures, the gospel, and those teachings that will bring us someday into Zion. Please bless those who have prepared these lessons and those of us who are earnestly striving to understand them better, that we can all be edified and rejoice together, and that we can be prepared for when the time comes that this talk is given to know what we must do to continue forward towards the cause of Zion. We love thee so much. We pray for those who were able to attend and those who were not able to attend as well. Please bestow thy spirit on all of us. We pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, McKay. All right. So next week, it will be Sunday, six days from now. And uh, until then, bye-bye.